Okay, so we'll go to Daniel chapter 5, and that's probably the right chapter. And then we'll also go to Daniel chapter 8. So as you might recall, we're now reaching at the fall of Babylon at this time. Nebuchadnezzar, he was the one who brought the empire in the height of its glory. And then we see a deterioration of the kingdoms with his uh, later sons. Now his son Belshazzar, uh, not his son, but as the generations continue to pass on, Belshazzar was the one who brought about the fall of Babylon. And if you've done your homework assignment, you probably reached there by now. But Belshazzar, he took the vessels out of the holy temple and used it for his uh, sexual party, so to speak, and his idolatrous worship. And then because of that, the Lord judged Babylon. So Babylon, it pretty much fell apart, and then somebody else took over the kingdom. And the ones who took over next were the Persians. Now the Persians, they had a nation that was extremely helpful to them. If it wasn't for this next group, then who knows if they would have conquered Babylon successfully or not. And those were the Medes. So the Bible talks about two kingdoms, the Medes and the Persians. Now we read a little bit about that at our last discipleship. But there's a key figure that you want to know, and a lot of people have been hyping about this when talking about end times, actually. And that is the figure Cyrus. Cyrus. So we're going to learn a little bit more about this mysterious figure, Cyrus. So, Widow Sin, again, his book is called A Bible Believer Looks at World History by Frederick Widowson, he mentions on page 86 that Cyrus, that uh, he's a natural leader. And as a matter of fact, he was known to uh, be uh, admirable amongst a lot of the people. They loved him as their leader. A few things concerning about Cyrus, which is somewhat interesting. They mention over here that he used to be raised by shepherds, actually. So he was raised by shepherds, and I think he had a... I'm trying to find the quotation over here. I don't think that they have it here. But they said that concerning a little bit about uh, Cyrus, that he served wine to his army and Persian councils, and then Durant, uh, you remember that historical name Durant, I mentioned him quite often. But Durant says that Cyrus never made a decision while sober. <laughs> he was always a drinker, but he was a conqueror, and then he made a big conquest, especially with Babylon, which was the most powerful kingdom of that time. Persia, some interesting notes about it, and this is from Durant. They mention about the Medes over here. Now, let me explain a little bit about the Medes. Remember, they were a kingdom that was very important. If it wasn't for these people, like I said before, perhaps Persia would not have won victoriously against Babylon. Durant says that it was from a tablet recording by Shalmaneser III into a country called Parsua around 837 BC. Supposedly 27 kings ruled over 27 thinly populated states and these include Amadai, Madai, and Medes over here. Now the Persians have a sac uh, sacred scriptures called Zend Avesta. Zend Avesta. Now, within the Zend Avesta, this is what it quotes concerning more about their culture and their beliefs, especially their religion. It described the homeland to be originally as a paradise. Herodotus, now you meant, I mentioned him quite often, mentions that Dio, uh, 
Deoses achieved power with the reputation for being just, but then became a vicious tyrant. During his leadership, the Medes became a threat to Assyria. Now, remember, Assyria before Babylon, they were the most powerful empire, but then Babylon took over. But the reason why Assyria had a hard time, their fall came through the power of the Medes. That's important to understand. It's not Babylon as a totality that the reason why Assyria fell. It was because of the Medes, actually. Now, isn't it interesting that if the Medes were the ones responsible for the fall of, oh, my, my memory is not working today. <laughs> Assyria, my brain's not working. Assyria, that they were also the ones responsible with Cyrus' reign and power to conquer Babylon. It says over here that Assyria was unable to put down the constant struggle uh, for freedom. It was the greatest of Cyaxares who destroyed Nineveh. So it was through the Medes that's why Nineveh fell and the Syrian Empire fell. The Medes also, they were the ones responsible for giving Persia the Aryan Indo-European language. Now that's what historians and linguists uh, mention. Now remember... Uh, the Aryans, they had their connections with India. I don't know if you remember that one. So India was an important nation during the BCs. The Aryans, they had their influence all the way up to Persia. So the Aryans, they are a very important group. The Medes gave Persia the Aryan Indo-European language, according to historians and linguists, if you would look that up. Some other things concerning the culture of Persia, they mentioned that it was, uh, this is by Widowson on page 86. He says that it was closely akin to the Aryan culture of the invaders of India. Darius I, in an inscription at Naqsh-e-Rustam, described himself as, quote, a Persian, the son of a Persian, an Aryan of Aryan descent. That's what Darius I described himself. So the Aryans, they were an important group of people that has historical roots with not just India, but Persia at that time. The Zoroastrians spoke of their mountainous, inhospitable land that produced such a hardy race of warriors as Aryano Vejo, the Aryan home. That's what they called it. They called the land and the homeland and their place as the Aryan home. So it's very important to them that time. Persians, when they took their writing, they used the Babylonian cuneiform for their inscriptions. And they also used the Semitic alphabet for their documents. A little bit more concerning about uh, Cyrus. This is by... Durant, he mentions about Cyrus as, quote, royal in spirit and action, capable of wise administration, as well as of dramatic conquest, the defeated and loved by those who had been his enemies. No wonder the Greeks made him the subject of innumerable romances and to their minds the greatest hero before Alexander, end of quote by Durant. He mentioned that he was handsome by all accounts, and he was a natural-born uh, leader. But his ambition, that was his undoing, because he always had a constant warfare that resulted in his death in a campaign against an obscure tribe. So it's kind of, Cyrus had a little bit of a similitude with Alexander that we're going to see. Basically, he built an empire. He created it, like Alexander. Cyrus did the same thing, but he did not live to enjoy it. His one weakness, Widowson says on the same page, was typical oriental cruelty, which his half-mad son, Cambyses, inherited. His attempt to conquer Egypt and add it to the empire succeeded, but resulted in his complete insanity. He lost 50,000 soldiers in the desert, and his campaign to conquer Carthage ended in failure. At its greatest size under Darius, the Persian Empire included 20 provinces or satraps embracing Egypt, Palestine, Syria, Phoenicia, Lydia, Phrygia, 
Ionia, Cappadocia, Cilicia, Armenia, Assyria, the Caucasus, Babylonia, Media, Persia, modern Afghanistan, and Baluchistan, India, west of the Indus River, and more. Never before had history recorded so extensive an area brought under one government. Persia ruled for 200 years from the country now known to us as Iran. Quoting again from Durant, the real basis of the royal power and imperial government was the army. An empire exists only so long as it retains its superior capacity to kill. Now, concerning about their religion, there are some interesting notes concerning about their religion over here from Persia. They report a great pro uh, Widdowson, page 87, page 87 of Widdowson's book. Persian divines reported that a great prophet appeared in the ancient home of the Arians, named Zarathustra. The Greeks called him Zoras uh, Zoroastres. He was supposedly divinely born after his guardian angel entered a plant and passed the juice onto a priest who offered a sacrifice after which a ray of heaven's glory entered a bosom of a girl of noble lineage. The rest of Zarathustra's story is interesting but very fanciful. From having his entrails filled with molten lead and not minding it one bit to his writing of the book of knowledge at the hands of the good god Ahura Mazda, the Zoroastrian religion is now born. So the, a lot of you may have heard of that before, but the Zoroastrian religion, that's how it came to be. And during the times of ancient Persia, that was their religion, so to speak. Concerning a little bit more about this religion, Widowson mentions this same page. It is from this that the Roman Catholic Church got their angels with wings, actually. It's from the Zoroastrian religion, of which there are none in the Bible. And Islam received their view of heaven as a garden, as opposed to the Bible's heavenly city, the New Jerusalem. Persian religion was mixed with Persian government, as in other cultures we have discussed, and the specter of the church-state alliance always ruled over the people. For example, minor moral offenses could be punished by flogging or death. However, their idea of morality was vastly different from ours. Pedophilia was learned from the Greeks according to Herodotus in spite of the fact that the Avesta lists such behavior as the unforgivable sin. A little bit more concerning about Cyrus. Look at, uh, you already have your hand at the two chapters, but uh, we'll come back to those later. Go to Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28, where we see Cyrus actually mentioned in your Bible. Isaiah chapter 44. And then we'll read verse 28. Now, you'll notice what is very interesting if you read concerning Cyrus from the prophet Isaiah. Cyrus is actually known to be as the shepherd. And then if you know about the history of Cyrus, he was actually supposedly raised by shepherds. This is from Herodotus. Uh, you can find in the work Justin's History of the World. If you look up Justin's History of the World, they mention that Cyrus was supposed to be exposed as an infant and left for dead actually. So that's the history of Cyrus. Basically, the legend goes that he was left for dead as an infant due to fear by his grandfather that he would take power. Now, that is actually very true. Cyrus did become extremely powerful, as we all know, like Alexander the Great, which would soon come after. However, there, the story goes, a poor shepherd and his wife actually raised him. Then, uh, when he is grown, Grown. Look what the Bible says over here. Verse 28. That saith of Cyrus, he is what? My shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built. And to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Now look what God calls Cyrus. My shepherd. 
That's pretty interesting, is it not? Why? Because he was raised by shepherds. So we see over here that Cyrus, he was actually known to be God's shepherd over here. As God's shepherd, he was actually going to take care of God's sheep, Israel. He was actually God's elect, anointed, and the shepherd, where the Israelites actually returned to their kingdom. So remember, Babylon was the one responsible in which where Israel lost their nation. But then it was Cyrus who conquered Babylon and restored the Jews back to their own place. So the nation of Israel was actually able to return in spite of a pagan nation. The Lord can use a pagan nation? Absolutely. He can use a pagan nation. And they could be his shepherd. Think about that one. That's what God called Cyrus, my shepherd. So let that sink in your head for a while on how the Lord uses people for his glory, actually. Now, Babylon, it goes this way where it falls, basically. Uh, in page 85, page 85 of Widowson's book, Nabonidus, he's the one that basically during his reign, that's where Persia was gaining control and was able to dominate. Nabonidus preferred archaeology to progress and spent a great deal of time excavating ancient Samaria while his own kingdom fell apart. That's the reason why, if you go to Daniel now, go to Daniel, and I believe I mentioned chapter 5. So let's look at Daniel chapter 5. Now notice it was King Belshazzar. Did you notice that? Verse 29, then commanded Belshazzar. It's not Nabonidus. So archaeologists and historians, they're going to criticize your Bible that it was during Nabonidus and not Belshazzar. But if you dig up history, I mentioned to you that Nabonidus was out excavating while his own kingdom fell apart. So the Bible's way ahead of you, ahead of the historians. Belshazzar was basically the one taking care of things while Nabonidus was away. That's the idea. That's why if you read at verse 29, then commanded Belshazzar, if he's second in charge, right? First in charge, Nabonidus. Second in charge, Belshazzar. Then look what he said. They clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be what? The third ruler in his kingdom. That's why the Bible says Daniel is the third ruler. He cannot be second. Why? Nabonidus first, Belshazzar second. That's how it goes. Now, if you look at Usher, now remember Usher is often quoted. That's his time a chronology that we go by in the Ruckman Reference Bible, Schoolfield Reference Bible. His dating has Cyrus marching against Babylon at 539 B.C. and taking it at 538 B.C. Now, it surprised the Babylonians because Herodotus mentions that the Babylonians believed they could have withstood a 20-year siege or so due to their great walls and their defenses. So how did the Persians conquer them? It was the Medes. Remember, the Medes were the ones that were helpful in conquering Assyria. That's why Babylon was able to take over more. And it's through the Medes again that Persia was able to conquer Babylon. The Median-Persian alliance, it permitted Darius to take over the administration of Babylon. And it is said, now I don't know how much of it is true, but if memory serves me, basically Cyrus was able to find something where it went underneath the defenses of Babylon. And the Babylonians, remember, they were partying. That was their downfall. God said to uh, Belshazzar that if you look at Daniel chapter 5 and verse 23, because Belshazzar, he spent his time partying, the Lord said that would be used as your downfall. So they were out partying while the Persians, they were able to sneak in their defenses and take over because you can't fight while you're drunk, so to speak, or partying. So that's how they conquered them. Widowson, he mentions more over here, quote, 537 B.C., Cyrus gave permission for all of the Jews to return to their country. Reading Daniel will give you a more personal look at the last part of the reign of the Babylonian kings 
and the first part of the reign of the Median Persian kings. The events of Esther took place later, beginning in 518 B.C. Trouble with Greece began for the Persians about 501 B.C. In 480 B.C., the Persian king Xerxes marches on Greece with an army of more than two million men. Persia's attempt to subjugate Greece fails with devastating defeats at the battles of Marathon and Plataea. Xerxes' mission met, met its greatest failure at the naval battle of Salamis. A lot of you know the famous uh, story that legends and even movies have talked about concerning about the Persians and their war with the, uh, with the Grecians. And then Spartans played a huge role in being powerful in military might. So Persia was falling apart while Greece was taking over. If you read the book of Esther, it is amazing that the mighty Persian Empire, that a lot of things were, a lot of the things were able to be changed and influenced due to the wife, the Persian Emperor's wife, Esther. And it's an amazing story how the Lord protected his people that time. Persia was the, was the empire and kingdom that the Lord mightily used to protect his nation Israel during that time. Why? Because it was God's final chance to give Israel its nation. And then as its defense and as its protector, so to speak, the Lord was giving Israel a chance. But then when you read the book of Nehemiah, the Jews would still not learn their lesson. And they keep retreating to its pagan ways. And what you're going to find out later on when Rome starts to take over, the religion of the Jews, Judaism, was, was mingled completely with uh, Babylonian origins. And then it became a new form of religion that Moses did not condone, Old Testament Moses. So Jews were falling apart despite of God using a pagan, wicked nation, Persia, to become its shield, so to speak. So then, let's talk a little bit more about the next nations now. Let's cover Greece. Uh, let me know if I'm out of bounds. I have no idea. Okay. All right. Persia has now been falling apart because there's a new conqueror now, and that is Greece. And Greece was basically the one that was toppling that Persian Empire. And its defenses and might and shield was cracking. Now Greece was definitely worldwide, which is why the Lord later used that empire for its New Testament, we're going to see. Greece has a lot of history. If there's one empire that you want to study a lot, it's the, it's the empire of Greece. It is intensely interesting, actually. And I don't know if I can cover all of it, but I'm going to cover as much as I can. Greece was the one where everything was spreading. Remember Genesis uh, chapter 9, Japheth shall be what? Enlarged. So Greece was definitely enlarging itself and spreading around the world that time as fulfillment to Noah's prophecy and blessing. Now, as we go through the history of Greece, it's going to go this way. If we go all the way from the beginning, you might recall a little bit of what I read about the Grecians' account of Noah's flood. So from there, we can get a little bit more of the early history of Greece. I also told you that that's where the Philistines came from. And not only that, Grecian education and philosophy it originated from Egypt, actually. So we see a little bit more of what was going on in the B.C.s, the early history of Greece. But I'm going to give a little bit more over here. So basically the category goes like this, if we're going to categorize the civilization of Greece. We first have the civilization of ancient Crete. Now Paul mentions about the, Crete, uh, the Cretans, I believe, at Titus. That moves to the mainland of Greece perhaps after the fall of the palace at Knossos. The Mycenaeans were the ones who inherited that wasted civilization afterward. Then we got the Achaeans who overran them, and they were less, civilized, less civilized 
uh, civilized than the Mycenaeans. Then what you have after that are the Dorians, and the Dorians are the lowest of the lot who invade and conquer the Achaeans. So that's how, the, how it goes. From, if we were to categorize the people from ancient Greece to more reaching toward closer the time of Alexander the Great. Now let me go from the, be, the way beginning of beginnings with the flood. So if you might recall concerning about Noah's flood, Zeus was supposedly the one angry with the human race caused the flood. And then Duke Kalion and his wife Perha were the ones who survived in a chest or an ark that rested on Mount Parnassus. There's, they had a son named Helen, so Deucalion and Perha, you can imagine that was Noah and his wife, basically. Helen was basically the father of all Greek tribes, and that was the son of Deucalion and Perha, the ones who were survivors in the chest from Zeus's flood. Helen was the one who was the, f and then they had a son named Helen, and he was the birthplace of all Greek tribes. He's the grandfather of Achaeus and Ion. Remember, if you might recall, that I mentioned that. Achaeus and Ion, they were the ones who brought forth the Achaean and the Ionian tribes that time of ancient Greece. Now, Durant, he mentions this, that one of Ion's descendants... Cecrops, with the help of the goddess Athena, founded the city and named after her. That's where Athens was born. So Athens was born through supposedly Cecrops, according to Durant, by the help of the goddess Athena. Theseus was basically the ruler and the grandson of Cecrops, the one who was the founder of Athens. And Theseus Theseus was supposedly the one who gave Athens order and peace and ended the sacrifice to Min Minos. A little bit more concerning about Athens and the early cities. These are early cities and famous cities of Greece that uh, you want to know. So now we see a little bit more with Greece with Athens. Now let's look at a little bit more. The other places that we want to look is Thebes. Legend has it in the, uh, Widdowson mentions at page 100, legend has it in the 14th century BC, a Phoenician, Cretan, or Egyptian king named Cadmus founded the capital Thebes. So now we're going to look at Thebes over here. Let's look at the importance of this nation. This is where Hercules comes from, actually. Widowson mentions that Cadmus taught the Greeks how to write and then killed a dragon. After Cadmus reigned his son Polydorus, his grandson Labdacus, his great-grandson Laos, and Laos' son Oedipus, who according to the playwright Sophocles killed his father and married his mother, although unintentionally. When he died, his sons fought over his throne, both dying several years later in a war that resulted in thieves being burnt to the ground. So remember the famous Oedipus complex, basically about the immorality and the infatuation with the mother. Some of you may have known that story about Oedipus, uh, where he had no idea that he married his mother, and there was a horrifying story to that, but that basically comes from Thebes, actually. So that's the significance of this nation. Uh, OED, I think it's E. Yep. Now, another one that we're going to look at is Hercules. He supposedly comes from one of these rulers over here, also known as Heracles and other names that people would give. Widowson mentions one of Thebes' aristocrats or ruling class was Amphitiron, whose wife Alc uh, Alcmene had an affair with Zeus while her husband was away at war, resulting in the birth of the hero Heracles. 
Zeus' wife, Hera, sent two serpents to kill the child, so that's Hercules, and Heracles, or glory of Hera, strangled them both. Linus, not, uh, this is kind of funny, Linus, not Snoopy's Linus, but one of the oldest names in music tried to teach him the lyre, a stringed instrument, but he didn't much like music, so he killed Linus with it. He then killed a lion with his bare hands, married Cleon of Thebes' daughter, Megara, and had some children. Hera sent madness upon him, and he killed his own children. He then consulted the oracle. Uh, now, the oracle is quite often mentioned in Grecian writings. So, let's see over here. I'm going to mention a little bit more about this oracle. So, he, Widowson spells it this way, concerning about the oracle. It was known as the Oracle at Delphi. Now, you're going to notice that a lot of rulers refer to this one as their excuse for the decisions they made. Now, that kind of is reminiscent of the ephod that kings would use to refer to to get messages from the divine. And then Satan has his own, and he called it the Oracle at Delphi. And that's quite often mentioned in a lot of Greek legends. So that's the reason why I wrote this down. You might want to know that one. That was basically Satan's ephod for the Grecians. So Heracles, or Hercules, consulted the oracle at Delphi and following orders went to serve the king of Tyr uh, Tyrenes for 12 years, performing 12 labors, joined the Argonauts who searched for the supernatural golden fleece, sacked Troy, helped the gods fight the giants, freed Prometheus, who gave men fire, brought Alcestis back to life, and occasionally killed his own friends by accident. After his death, he was worshipped as a god, and several tribes claimed, claimed he was their originator, apparently due to his fundamental lack of morals. His descendants were supposed to have conquered Greece, ending the age of heroes. So Hercules was supposedly the last one. If we were to compare from our previous studies about the gods and the giants and then the kings, we can see the shift more and more where it was going from a deified sons of God format to more of a human format. Now remember, as we studied all the other nations, they all claimed that the kings and their founders had connections with the gods. And then with these gods, they were able to build their cities and name after them. But then we see more and more and more how it's becoming more and more humane. And then with more and more humanity, you'll see a rise of this one, humanism, intellectualism. And that's what we see at the height of Grecian philosophy as we get these famous Greek philosophers coming out. As I read these legends, you can see how more and more and more it's coming from humans uh, having connection with the gods and then it's becoming more humane. Also, you'll notice some interesting thing here that uh, it mentioned Hercules helped the gods fight the giants. So it seems like that there was a... Uh, there was a in fightings between the remnants of the sons of God and the sons of God themselves, which is not a surprise. It's reflective of Genesis 6. Remember Genesis 6, there was great violence in the earth in those days. I also re read you ancient Indian le uh, legends of India where there were gods who built warships and there were battles amongst each other, actually. So if you look at conspiracy theories today, so to speak, uh, it should be no surprise where a lot of them would have infightings between each other. There is, there is a pattern where they all go toward a small group of elites, but it's not altogether a clean format organization all the time. There's always infightings as well. Why? Because everyone lusts for power. Everyone lusts for power. Some ancient historians, Widowson claims on page 101, that the legend of Hercules was a reworking of the stories of both Jonah and Samson. That's what he says. Aristotle, in his metaphysics books, chapter 8, 
said that the origins of Greek religion and philosophy has been lost and there were a lot of it added to it for political purposes. This is according to Polybius as well. Now, E.W. Bullinger says this. Bullinger says this, which is pretty interesting. There was a Bishop Horsley who traced virtually all Greek mythology back to the Hebrew Bible. So that's kind of interesting. Aratus. This was biographed by Plutarch in his Lives. So Plutarch in his work Lives mentioned that the constellation of Hercules in the 3rd century BC, that he was standing on the coiled serpent's head. Now that is reflective of what? Jesus Christ, his seed, where he was, his foot would be on top of the head of the serpent. So we see Satan always imitating Bible. So a lot of the Greek legends, what is important to understand is they are copycatting from the Bible. Famous Greek legends and stories you hear, they're all copycatting from the Bible. The, every movie that wants to uh, dramatize and make cool stories of Greek legends and mythology, you got to understand this. All of that originated from the Bible. Greek pagans were the ones that later did their thing later. So we see a lot of interesting things here concerning, concerning about Thebes. Now, concerning about the oracle at Delphi, here's the idea that you want to know why kings refer to this. Okay, I'm going to give you the work to prove it. This is page 400 from Rossiter's book called Greece. So Stuart Rossiter, R-O-S-S-I-T-E-R. Now, he mentions this concerning about the oracle at Delphi. Quote, Those who wished to consult it first sacrificed a sheep, goat, boar, or other animal, after which, if the omens were favorable, they went into a room adjoining the Adeton, which is known as Inner Shrine. There they awaited their turn, which was determined by lot, unless they had received from the Delphians the Promantea, or prior right of consultation. No women were admitted. They handed in questions written on leaden tablets, many of which have been discovered. The Pythia, who's also known as a priestess, who delivered the oracle was a peasant woman over 50 years old. At the height of the oracle's fame, there were three of them. After purifying herself in the Castellan fountain and drinking of the water of the Casotis and munching a laurel leaf, she took her seat upon the tripod, which was placed over the chasm in Adeton. Intoxicated by the exhalations from the chasm, she uttered incoherent sounds, which were interpreted in hexameter verse by a poet in waiting. That kind of sounds like speaking in tongues, right? Yeah. That also kind of sounds like when you're on drugs and you utter incoherent sounds. Yep. The interpretation, which was always obscure and frequently equivocal, it yeah, sounds like speaking of tongues, was handed over to the inquirer who not seldom returned more mystified than he had come. Even Croesus, the great benefactor of Delphi, was cruelly misled by the oracle on the eve of his war with Persia. So that's uh, how it goes. But we're going to see a little bit more and more when we cover different nations, how they use the oracle at Delphi. Now, you overheard that they would use three women concerning this, and they were over 50 years old, which is why you would see in these Hollywood movies three figures using some sort of oracle at Delphi. Sometimes they would call it in some movies, and it would be, old, uh, it would be older women over the age of 50. Now let's talk about the next nation, Sparta. Sparta. And that's where you hear your famous movie of concerning about the 300, etc. All right. Widowson says, Spartan's golden age came when a politician named Lysurgus' uncle, King Charilus, 
received certain laws from the oracle at Delphi. See that? They always use this. They were called retra or edicts and were supposedly the laws that Lycurgus would give to Sparta. This is recorded by Herodotus, the Greek historian, and may have happened in the 7th century BC. There were other lawgivers in Greek city-states at that time. Zaleucus at Locris in 660 BC, Draco at Athens around 620 BC. You've heard of draconian laws, you know, the ones that were brutal. So it's all, uh, it all has Spartan roots, so to speak. And Charondas at the Sicilian city of Catana around 610 BC. With the interplay between the Near East and Greece, as described earlier, it is no wonder that they might be inspired by the law of Moses, rediscovered by Josiah around 621 BC, according to Durant, which matches Usher's calculations to within three years. Lycurgus gave his law to Sparta in spite of having his eye put out by an objector named Alcander, whom he proceeded to win over. Finally, the lawgiver retired to Delphi and starved himself to death as he felt that was the service every politician should give to the state that I can't, and I can't help but agree, <laughs> says Widowson. <laughs> One legend is that he forbade the writing down of his laws. Historians disagree on the importance of the laws he gave to Sparta. Plutarch and Polybius speak of land re re redistribution. Thucydides, another Greek historian, denies that ever happened. The Spartan constitution was a result of Lycurgus' code. Now, Sparta, it would have been known as a fascist state in today's world, actually. I'm going to give you some of the really strict and harsh, cruel laws, actually. Eugenics, manip uh, this is page 104 of Widowson's book. Eugenics, manipulation of who gets to live and die, was practiced in its crudest form. After birth, a father decided if his child was fit enough to live or if it was to be thrown off of Mount Tegidas to the jagged rocks below. Surviving infants were often killed in the toughening up process that Spartan life, the Spartan code, required. Men and women were counseled on marrying healthy people rather than for love. King Archidamus was fined for marrying too small a wife, actually. <laughs> Husbands were encouraged to lend their wives to men of outstanding accomplishments so that superior children might be born into their family. How many of you husbands want to volunteer for that, huh? Lycurgus ridiculed, says Plutarch, jealousy and sexual faithfulness in marriage and believed that people should be bred like horses and dogs to improve the stock of citizens for the state. These guys were mad, man. At the age of seven, the Spartan boy was taken from the parents and brought up by the state. His entire education was designed to make him a better warrior to make him tough. He lived with his comrades until the age of 30, usually sleeping outside and suffering every discomfort possible for the purpose of toughening him up. The Spartans were bisexual and homosexual behavior was encouraged. Celibacy was a crime, though, and the men and women were expected to, to produce offspring for the state. And this is fascism at its finest, you can tell. Childless couples were the subject of ridicule and scorn as well. <laughs> so this is to totally uh, satanic and messed up. But this is very interesting. It is not wise to glorify Greek culture at all. It was immoral and ultimately decadent, not God-honoring in the least, the heroism and patriotism of its members notwithstanding. So you see, a lot of Christians, they get involved with patriotism, but you've got to be careful of that. True, there are some things that are godly principles that we can be patriotic about, but not altogether. There's a lot of wickedness in America as well. Patriotism is not a sign of Christian submission to the government or Christian uh, morality. It is a sign of demonism sometimes you got to think about. These guys were patriots at its finest, man, Spartans. But look how wicked it is, this system. Spartans hated foreigners and were not allowed to travel abroad themselves without permission from the government. 
uh, kind of like we're hitting a little bit right now with COVID-19. One would also think in this environment that women were treated very badly, their only real purpose to produce children for the, sta for the state. Uh, what is interesting, though, is this. Women did have the freedom to speak out, engage in athletic activities, and spend a lot of time out, out of doors, according to the book, Women in the Classical World. But ultimately, the reasoning for this was to make them better at breeding healthy children and raising them to be brave soldiers. Let's see over here. So we see a little bit, uh, we see a lot concerning about Spartans and the wickedness of it. The idea was of it was to be strong, tough, which is why the Persians had a hard time with a few hundreds of the Spartans, so to speak. But you got to realize this is that uh, what, what mankind tried to build up itself in their own intellectual, in their own might and strength, their own ability is still satanic at its finest. Like our world today, they're using their human knowledge of what makes sense to make a stronger, more powerful people and government, but it is still satanic at its finest. How so? Because it contradicts the Bible. It's that simple. Kingdoms come and go. Look at Sparta. Very powerful in military might. Gone. They're just gone. But I'll tell you what, that word of God continued on for centuries to millennia. So if you always stick by the book, then you, know which, uh, then you know that your kingdom will continue. America originally started out that way, despite of its Masonic origins that infiltrated. Despite of that, America started out with the Word of God. That's why it became powerful at its finest. But when you go against the Word of God, nations and kingdoms fall apart. All right, we're going to look at what, uh, another major city, which you probably did not know. A major city for the powerful Grecian Empire was Corinth, actually, where you get your book of First and Second Corinthians. And we're going to see some interesting things, what Paul said about the Corinthians, that is reflective of the Grecian culture that time. And then we'll cover also the, the stupid Greek philosophers. Did I say stupid? Yeah, they're stupid. I don't care how intelligent they are. They are stupid. They're, they're, they define stupidity at its finest. So we'll cover these famous philosophers next discipleship. All right, your homework assignment is the next ad lib commentary track. All right, make sure you listen to that. God, my Father, I pray that we've learned so much from our history. And what men learn from history is that men never learn from history. Let that not be us. Let us see how much of the Grecian culture is reflective of society today and that we would not fall prey to it. And that we also see your hand at work in using pagan wicked kings like you did with Cyrus to continually protect your people like you've done with us in America so far. But things don't last forever, Lord. And help us to learn from our history. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.